Welcome to Get Smarter and Make Stuff. Uh, today I'm going to show you um, where I've gotten to with a really cool project uh, called the Electronic Lead Screw, which is a augmentation for my metal lathe. Um, this is a really, really neat project um, from inspired by the work of one of my favorite YouTube channels, James Clow uh, over at Clow42. Um, really neat. What I've basically done is just built what he designed. So uh, if you want more details about this project, definitely go over and check out. He has a whole series of really excellent videos that go into depth on uh, how to build one of these for yourself, how he went about building it. And I, I learned a lot by watching those. Uh, but I did build one for myself and uh, really have been enjoying the process. It's not quite done yet, uh, but I thought I would take the time to show you where I've gotten to and explain a little bit about what the project is and what remains to be done. So let's head over to the metal lathe and I'll show you what I've gotten to. This is my metal lathe, the Grizzly G0768Z. I showed it off in the shop tour video, which I can put a link to right here if you want to watch that. Uh, an important part of it is what's called the lead screw, which is this piece right here that runs the length of the, uh, of the, the bed. Um, as the motor turns, gears in the head end, and we'll look at that in a minute, turn the lead screw in some ratio to the rotation of the spindle. So uh, this lever right here connects the carriage to the lead screw so that you can't no longer move it with the crank. It's, it's connected to the lead screw and will only move if the, if the lead screw rotates. Uh, so when the motor is turning, that means that the lead screw is uh, causing the carriage here to advance at a fixed rate um, with respect to the spindle. And for turning operations, you usually want this to be something like five thousandths uh, of an inch per revolution of the spindle, um, which gives you a, a, a nice, consistent surface finish on the turn part. Uh, you can do that with the crank, and in fact, you know, I often do, and people who are more skilled than I am can get much better results. But it's really nice to be able to have the carriage just move along as the uh, spindle turns at a consistent rate and you'll, you'll get better results that way. Um, I can't show that to you right now because I've taken this apart in order to do the thing that we're talking about. So um, this lead screw is super important because arguably one of the greatest technological advances of the last 200 years was the invention of the screw cutting lathe. Um, it's been said that if you have a screw cutting lathe, you can basically invent the rest of the metal shop and, and, and from there essentially bootstrap all modern technology all the way up to like cell phones or whatever. Um, and uh, the way it works is through the lead screw. So the trick here is that we can choose to have the, uh, the carriage um, advance when it's connected to the lead screw in some rotation uh, ratio rather where as the spindle rotates for every rotation of the spindle the lead screw advances some fixed amount. Now something for something like five thousandths per revolution that's handy for turning down to a diameter. Uh, but if you make that a number more like, say, 1 20th of a rotation, sorry, 1 20th of an inch per rotation, uh, well now, because that's perfectly steady, right, because the lead screw is rotating and carrying the carriage along 1 20th of an inch for every rotation of the spindle, uh, if you put a triangular cutting bit into the, um, the, the, the tool holder, what you'll get is threads, like, you know, for a, for a screw. It doesn't have to be triangular. If you're cutting Acme threads, it might be, you know, trapezoidal or whatever. But the important thing is that uh, you can cut threads. And this is a huge deal. Like, very, very many aspects of modern society rely on this, right? The, you, can, you can use it all sorts of stuff. So super important advantage, super interesting um, part of history that the screw cutting lead was invented. I realized while I was editing this that I kind of dropped a big tease with the comment about being able to cut threads being a big deal. It is, but I thought I would amplify on that and point you to a series called The Origin of Precision, um, which is on the Machine Thinking YouTube channel. It explores how we got from pre-industrial levels of technology to where we are today, where we can like routinely purchase incredibly inexpensive items that are produced to levels of precision that were completely unachievable until pretty recently in our history. Um, in particular, I want to point you to the second video in that series, which is called The 1751 Machine That Made Everything. It is, of course, a metal lathe. Anyway, check it out. The whole series is really good. Okay, let's get back to my little project. 
Let's go up to the headstock end of the lathe and I'll show you how this usually works from there. This is the headstock end of the lathe where the motor drives this pulley which connects via these belts to the spindle here. Um, but we can also uh, connect other gears like this one here uh, to drive the lead screw which terminates right down here. Ordinarily you'd see a bunch of gears like this one in here um, called change gears that would connect from the spindle down to the lead screw. Um, they're kind of a pain in the ass to use because every time I want to change the relationship between the lead headstock or the spindle and the lead screw, say I need like five thousandths of an inch per revolution to turn a part down to diameter, and then I want to flip the part around and uh, you turn the other end, uh, and then I want to thread it and you know do this, do that. Every time I want to change from one rotational relationship to another, uh, then I have to get in here and mess around with the gears and you know like unscrew this thing and get the backlash right and drop a bunch of bolts on the floor like 16 times and it just it just takes a long time and it's it's really kind of a pain. Now on a nicer lathe you would see a series of layup levers up here that would allow you to change gears um, on the fly by you know picking okay now I want you know 1 20th of, of an inch per revolution so I'm threading you know maybe quarter 20 um, and now I want to go back to turning, so I want to go back to 5 thousandths per revolution. Uh, but I don't have a nice lathe. I have a small lathe because this is a small shop, and I'm into everything under the sun, and I can't afford the best of everything, um, even though I've been very fortunate to be able to purchase the tools that I have. So what I can do, though, is introduce a sensor, which detects the rotation of the spindle, and then outputs that data to a microcontroller, and then the microcontroller can drive a stepper motor hooked up to the lead screw. Okay, and now you can use software and some sort of control panel to select whatever race you want. And so now instead of changing gears out, um, it's as simple as pushing a couple buttons and saying, right now I'm turning, so I want like a you know five or six thousandths per rev. All right, great, I'm done with that. Let's thread. Let's go to you know 20 uh, TPI. Do that. Flip the part around. Go back to five thousandths an inch. Turn it down. So forth and so on. Very, very, very convenient. Um, and if you do like I do and make use of the work of somebody smarter than you, then it's not even that hard to do because you just buy some relatively inexpensive parts, as I've done, and uh, just follow the directions. So uh, really good stuff. I, like I said, following the work here of James Clow over at Clow42, really excellent uh, job he's done putting together something really nice, and I've been uh, having a good time putting the parts together. So where I'm at with this is that I've gotten as far as pulling the parts out of the headstock here, and you can't really see it, but there's a, a plastic uh, 3D printed pulley back in here um, that I can use to drive the uh, sensor, which is over on the bench. Um, so I've gotten the sensor hooked up to the, the the headstock, uh, but I'm currently working on the electronics. Um, unfortunately, I didn't record any of my previous uh, progress uh, since I started working out before I got inspired to make videos again. So um, well, we can just go over to the bench and I can show you where I've gotten with the electronics and uh, talk about what's coming up uh, next. Okay, what we're seeing here is the enclosure for the electronics and power system. Um, on the left here, we have a TI launch, what is it, XL? 2800049C microcontroller. Really, really powerful board. Way more powerful than like an Arduino. It's 100 megahertz. It's got two built-in rotary quadrature decoders and a bunch of other really cool features. Um, I can totally see myself using more of these in the future. Um, on the opposite side, we have the 48 volt power supply for the motor, uh, the motor control, and in the middle, some connectors for various uh, bits of wiring and stuff, and then a couple of wall warts that deliver power to the board, 5 volt power to the board, and then 12 volt power to the case fan, which I've um, installed, and I have also cut a hole in the front of the uh, in the front of the case for um, uh, for air to escape. So, th and this is all pretty much exactly what James describes over on his videos. Um, which I could not possibly improve on, so highly recommend you go over there if you're interested in um, doing one of these yourself. Um, where I'm at now is basically everything is hooked up as you see it here, but it doesn't work. <laughs> when I plug it in and turn on the power, um, basically the control panel doesn't light up, which could indicate a problem basically anywhere. Um, I should see like a little message scroll across here and we should get an RPM readout, and none of that is happening. Um, I suspect I may have done damage to the board at some point. Um, there's a series of jumpers here that really should uh, not be where in the position they are now when you've got both USB 
and external power hooked up, and I think I might have done that, um, so it's possible I damaged the board. I, at the moment, I can't even get like a simple LED blinking light program to work, so um, I think it might be the board. I've ordered a replacement, kind of waiting for that to come in to see if that's the problem. The other possibility is my cabling. Um, I had to do a lot of cabling, um, you know, <clears throat> making up connectors, and I, I, I'm pretty happy with it in the sense that I've never done it before, and I, I, you know, makes it a lot neater, a lot nicer job to have like the external panel connectors on the um, on the board, so I can just sort of plug things in, you know, with these these aviation style plug connectors, you know, running from the control panel or to the motors or whatever. But uh, uh, it's possible I've got a short there. I don't think that's the case. I did make up a little teeny tiny test cable um, and connected the board directly to the control panel and and got nothing. So I suspect it's a uh, it's something in the electronics. Uh, but we'll see. I don't know. That, I'm sure that'll be one of our videos coming up in the future where. Uh, we can talk about what I found and how I how I got around it. Um, so that's where I'm at. Um, no smoke so far, so I guess that's good. But I got to figure out what the problem is. Um, so we'll see. I'll give you more progress um, as we go. Hopefully, maybe even the next video is the thing is up and running and I can show you how it works. That'd be pretty great. I'd be pretty excited to be done with this project. Not that I'm not enjoying it. I really am. But, you know, built it to use it. Um, and also to get smarter, of course, it is the you know point to get smarter and make things. But it uh, would be nice to move on to something else. I've got a ton of other ideas for videos and things I want to make. So it's always nice to get something done. Uh, anyway, that's all for today. Hope you found this interesting. Uh, leave me a comment down below telling me whether you thought that was true or not. Uh, and if you feel so inclined, hit like uh, and or subscribe. So uh, thanks for watching.